Good evening. It's nice to talk to an audience I can actually see. <laughs> Those of you who know ruckus know that I call it the weekly food for thought fight over the news of the day and the trends of the times. It was off for a couple of months during the summer uh, for the refurnishing of the set and a slight changing of the format. And I hope you uh, realize we're back on Thursday evenings at 7, but not this Thursday evening at 7 because we're preempted by Eleanor Franklin and Theodore Roosevelt, very fine Ken Burns series that is running through next weekend. Our format this evening is simple. Each of our speakers will deliver prepared remarks of about 10 minutes each. The topic generally deals with the proper role of government when it comes to the nation's economy. As you can see, officially, our topic is the economy does more government hurt or help. Now, after both our speakers conclude, we'll have Stephanie Kelton first, then Joe Hasleg. We will open the session to questions from the audience, and I need to offer a few ground rules. Questions must be succinct. Before you state the question, please give your name and to whom you're addressing the question, although both of the panelists will have time to comment and react if they choose to. There will be no speech making tolerated or any inappropriate comments. If any of you do engage in that kind of behavior, be forewarned, you may be invited to be a panelist on ruckus. <laughs> I will try to the extent humanly possible to make sure that our speakers have roughly equal time to respond to questions and to each other. Now let's meet our first speaker, and by the way, biographical information about each was supplied to me by individuals or organizations representing them, so it's essentially their view, and uh, I'm happy to read it as was given to me. Stephanie Kelton is Associate Professor and Chair of the Department of Economics at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. She is also Editor-in-Chief of the top-ranked blog, New Economics Perspectives and a member of the top wonks network of the nation's best thinkers. Her book, The State, the Market, and the Euro 2001, predicted the debt crisis in the Eurozone, and her subsequent work correctly predicted that, one, quantitative easing would not lead to high inflation, two, government deficits would not cause a spike in U.S. interest rates, three, the S&P downgrade would not cause investors to flee treasuries, and four, the U.S. would not experience a European-style debt crisis. Professor Sheldon is a frequent comment commentator on national radio and television. She consults with policymakers, investment banks, and portfolio managers across the globe. Please welcome Stephanie Kelton. Thank you, everyone. Good evening. So I have just 10 minutes to tackle a question of uh, pretty enormous magnitude. And I think, as the introductory remarks suggested, there is really not an easy, quick way to answer a question like this. In fact, I think it's important to recognize that if you believe there is a quick, simple answer to the question, does more government help or hurt, you are probably not thinking very carefully. You're probably oversimplifying, shall we say, things. And so, uh, d but we do just have 10 minutes. So I have to simplify to some extent, and I have to figure out how exactly to attack this question, from which angle am I going to uh, focus my remarks. And because I am uh, not just an economist, but a macroeconomist, I'm going to tend to focus on the role of government in the economy, and where by government I primarily mean the federal government, and where by the economy I mainly mean the national economy. So I'm not as much talking about state and local government and their decisions and uh, the impacts on state and local governments, all right? So if your answer to this question, what is the best way for government to improve the economy, is a very short list of things. Maybe that includes something like the following. It's really just simple. It's one thing. Just limit the size of government, and everything else will take care of itself. Again, you're probably oversimplifying. Now, 
I'm going to use this as an example, and my position is going to be counter in many ways to the philosophy that uh, you see here, but I'm not accusing Congressman Ryan of holding such a simplistic view as the one that I just put up, right? That there's only one thing one needs to do. But I do think it serves as a, as a good example of a philosophy that tends to suggest that the role of government, the best way to improve the economy is, look, we believe that a renewed commitment to limited government will unshackle our economy and create millions of new jobs and opportunities for all people of every background to succeed and prosper. Under this approach, the spirit of initiative, not political clout, determines who succeeds. Okay? So that's the philosophy, and here's the way I see it playing out in practice. Okay, when we translate the philosophy into actual economic policy, I think it generally looks something like the following. What you really need to do is unshackle the job creators, the makers in our economy, who are burdened by the oppressive taxes, and if you would just free them, liberate them, jobs and money, tax revenue will come raining down on the economy. Okay, this is the philosophy in practice. Unshackle the spirit of initiative. So Lucy tells Charlie Brownback what to do. And she shows him the rationale. And it's got good economics behind it. This is what Lucy says, right? Let me show you why this will work. So she produces the Laffer curve. Now the Laffer curve is something that you can find in virtually any economics textbook particularly a macroeconomics textbook, and it is named after its developer, uh, an economist by the name of Art Laffer, who went to dinner one evening, a little over three decades ago, in Washington, D.C., with a couple of journalists and a fellow economist, and on the back of a napkin, sketched out this curve. And what Laffer argued was that taxes are too high, and that if you reduce marginal tax rates, in particular, on incomes at the very top, that what you will do is so incentivize the job creators that they will not be able to help themselves because the incentive is there for them now to go out and make something and produce something, hire some people, be an entrepreneur, it gets your spirit up, the tax cut will do it. So not only will you end up with more jobs and more output, Lerner said, you'll actually end up with more tax revenue. You cut marginal tax rates from this level or this level down to this level, and tax revenues actually increase. It's magnificent. You won't believe it. John Kenneth Galbraith was the chief economist for JFK, and Galbraith, sort of mocking this position, said, well, Laffer basically is telling us that the poor won't work because they have too much money, and the rich won't work because they have too little. <laughs> All right? So Art Laffer gets an invitation, because he's still around, and he consults with policymakers all over the country. And so Governor Brownback invites Art Laffer out to Kansas. Come out and help us. We want to create some jobs here in Kansas. We need some advice. Tell us what to do. Art. So Art shows up and collects his $70,000 consulting fee, paid for by the taxpayers in the state of Kansas, and Laffer tells the governor what to do. What does he say? You should cut taxes, because this will incentivize the job creators. So the governor says, let's do it. Let's put this to the test. It's sort of like the economics of the field of dreams. If you've seen the movie, it's the idea that if you build it, they will come. Okay? If you create the right atmosphere for the job creators, give them regulatory certainty, eliminate bureaucracy, government regulation, all that stuff they hate, get rid of that to the extent you can, and then cut taxes. If you can get them to zero, perfect. Get business taxes down it and hack away at income taxes, you won't believe what will happen. Okay? 
So what happened? This is an effort by government to actually help, the idea that government can help. So we're seeing this play out across the state line. This article appeared yesterday in the Kansas City Business Journal. This is a quote from the Vice President for Government Affairs in Overland Park at their Chamber of Commerce. He's commenting on the effects of this policy on the Kansas side. He says, we've had conversations with people and they think it's nice, but we haven't seen any rush to hire new people or build new facilities. There's still the tendency to wait for the demand first. It's unusual to take the approach to build up the supply and expect the demand to come later, to follow. Wait a minute. If you build it, they will come. You're just supposed to create the incentives. What's going on? I think a better question is not, did it help? But for whom is it helping? OK, Kansas is lagging behind the, na the nation as a whole. Private sector job growth in Kansas is a full percentage point lower than the national average. We have fallen behind the state of Missouri, Oklahoma, and Colorado. The Kansas Legislative Research Department and Nonpartisan Department estimates that by 2018, Kansas will have lost, not gained, a la Laffer Curve, four and a half billion dollars in revenue. The bottom 20% of taxpayers in Kansas are paying now on average $166 more in income tax, while the 1% are paying on average nearly $20,000 less. So it does help. It certainly appears to be helping the governor's challenger, <laughs> who is leading in all but one of the polls that I have seen, and I'm watching pretty closely, he's leading in every demographic category, including with men and women. He's leading in all age groups. He's leading in all racial groups. The one category where the governor is doing better than his Democratic challenger is with those who have only a high school degree. The problem, I think, with this philosophy that all you need to do is deregulate and cut taxes and the job creators will do their thing is that it presupposes the most important part of capitalism, and that is demand. Capitalism runs on sales and spending creates income. We have arrived at a point with the national dialogue where we are vilifying spending in the economy. We've made it the enemy. Capitalism runs on sales. One person's spending is another person's income. And income leads to sales. When our income goes up, consumption goes up. And that means you're buying things. And that means our businesses have customers. Sales lead to jobs. Businesses hire when they're swamped with demand, not when you dangle a tax cut carrot in front of them. Capitalism is a system that works well only when there are enough customers spending enough money to keep sales and profits growing. We've got a long experience with capitalism in this country. This graph goes all the way back to 1875. Those gray bars that you see there are either recessions or depressions. The thicker the bar, the more severe the downturn. You can see that in our past history, going back to 1875, we used to have depressions all the bloody time. Government was very small back then, only 5% of the total economy. We had no Federal Reserve for most of that period, and we had a gold standard, and we had absolutely huge swings in output and employment. The business cycle was off the charts. We were everywhere. Then we had Roosevelt and the New Deal, and we institutionalized a bigger government that was there to provide a stabilizing force in the economy that kept incomes up in a downturn. So recessions replaced depressions. They came much less frequently, and they were far less severe than they had been. Even the Great Recession, the thing we experienced most recently, pales in comparison to our long-term history. Hey, we were hemorrhaging jobs during the Great Recession. At one point, we were losing 800,000 jobs every month in the US, an absolute catastrophe. And this is how government helps. 
We institutionalized, after World War II, a system that buttresses those downturns. It works like a shock absorber in your car. So when you hit the bumps, you don't have to take on the massive wallop that you would otherwise take on because government deficits cushion the blow. When unemployment goes up, this is the unemployment rate, this is the government deficit. You can see how they move in almost perfect op opposing motion, right? So when the unemployment rate goes up, the government's deficit goes up. And when unemployment comes down, deficits come down. And it happens every single time. And the reason it's important is because when the economy experiences a recession, and it will, and it always will, when the economy goes into recession, people lose their jobs. You lose your job, you lose your income. With no income, you don't pay income taxes. So government tax revenues go off a cliff. At the same time, spending to support the unemployed, unemployment compensation, food stamps, Medicaid, and the like, those types of spending automatically increase. That's why they're called automatic stabilizers. It doesn't take a permission slip from Congress. We don't need these guys to work together to do what needs to be done to stop the free fall. We've institutionalized it so that the changes happen automatically and they keep the economy from spiraling from a recession into a full-blown depression. It's one important way that government helps. Here's how government hurts. When we watch the deficit increasing, and because the Great Recession was so severe, the deficit increased a lot. We had a deficit that increased to something like 10, 11% of our GDP. And policymakers start to panic. And they start to fight over the increasing deficit. And then they start to try to figure out how to fight against the increasing deficit. It's like being at the wheel of your car when your car goes into a skid, and your instinct is to turn the wheel in the opposite direction. But we all know that's exactly the opposite of what the manual tells you to do. When your car goes into a skid, you're supposed to turn the wheel into the skid. That's how you regain control. That's how you regain balance. We have the wrong impulse. We're trying to fight against the increasing deficit by reducing spending, by raising taxes, doing things that are designed to reduce the deficit, but which only make the economy weaker. So we've got two political parties. One of them runs around telling everybody that we have a spending problem, by which they mean we need to be spending less. The other party says, no, 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 you've got this all wrong. It's not a spending problem at all. It's a revenue problem, by which they mean we need to raise taxes. And don't you know both of these things take income out of the economy, which reduces spending, which kills sales, which kills jobs. So we've got two political parties doing harm. To keep the recovery going, and it does appear to be weakening, we've got to make sure there are enough customers to keep the demand high enough to keep sales and profits high. Once sales and profits falter, that's when businesses begin to cut production and lay off workers. We've got to have the demand. Question is, where's it going to come from? It can only come from three places. It's us in the private sector, it's the government, or it's the rest of the world. It can't come from anywhere else. Those are all the sources of demand. So if we let the government just completely check out of the game, and the rest of the world is running trade surpluses against us, then we're left to try to hold the whole thing together. And the problem is the way that we have been holding the whole thing together for too many decades is by the private sector taking on more and more and more debt to keep buying the output, to keep the jobs, to keep the economy going. We never had a public debt problem. Everybody ran around saying public sector debt, public sector debt. What a crisis. We had and still have a private debt problem. This is what's wrong with the economy, or at least it's part of what's wrong. There's nothing wrong with borrowing to finance consumption if your income is keeping up so that you can service your growing debt, but that hasn't been happening in the U.S. for a very, very long time. There was a time, the golden age of capitalism, the 40s and 50s and into the 60s, when workers shared in the prosperity. Productivity went up, 
output per worker was going up and workers shared in those gains and they enjoyed rising compensation. That hasn't been happening. It hasn't happened for decades, starting in around the 1970s. Productivity continues to go up. We're very productive people, workers, but we no longer share in those gains. Look at the rate of growth of productivity compared to the rate of growth of compensation. Even in this so-called recovery, only those at the very top have been made better off. The vast majority of workers have seen their incomes go down, and they're still down compared to where they were before the start of the recession. Only the top 20%, and really only the top 10%, have seen their incomes not only recover, but recover tremendously, right? These reports came out today. There were poverty reports that came out. We're celebrating, by the way, because fewer Americans are in poverty. The line went down. The problem is we've got 45 million Americans who are in poverty today. We don't have anywhere near enough jobs to satisfy everyone who is ready, willing, and able to work. Right now, we've got close to 25 million Americans who want full-time work and can't find it. Four million jobs, four million. Even if many of them are lazy, shiftless bums, the vast majority are not. And if they're doing everything they can to secure employment and participate in this economy, there are nowhere near enough jobs to enable them to do so. Workers are getting less and less as a share of total GDP. Going back to the 50s, we used to get workers as a whole used to get about half of the total economic pie. And now it's down closer to 40%. The finance industry has grown into a behemoth. We talk about the size of government. This is the finance sector in this economy. It's massive compared to the size of government. This is from the Wall Street Journal. Our economy has changed in nature. We have become a financialized economy. Manufacturing on a declining trajectory. Fire sector, finance, insurance, real estate, they don't really make anything except they collect fees, right, profits and so forth. Look at their trajectory, a doubling over this period of time. It's part of what's wrong, I would argue. So what do we do? This is the closing slide. What do we do? Just in closing, and maybe there will be time in the Q&A uh, to um, expand on these a little bit more. First, I have long been a, a supporter of a federally funded, locally administered jobs program, something modeled on the WPA, the Works Progress uh, Administration, the CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps, the NYA, the National Youth Administration, which employed millions and millions of young people who, by the way, have unemployment rates double the rate of, uh, of you know, um, middle-aged people in this country. So a federally funded jobs program, infrastructure investment, our infrastructure is absolutely degraded, de dilapidated, um, and, and, and a national embarrassment. The American Society of Civil Engin Engineers every couple of years puts out a report card. The good news is that our grade is now a D plus. And I say that is good news because the last report card, our grade was a D. This is everything from uh, airports to our um, water treatment facilities, bridges, railways, hospitals. It is our national infrastructure. It is in severe disrepair. The estimate is that we need to spend approximately $3.6 trillion to get our infrastructure up to snuff. This is something we ought to be doing. The longer we wait, the worse it gets, the bigger the price tag gets. There was a time when this had broad bipartisan support. Republicans, Democrats, everyone agreed you do infrastructure. Now we don't even do that. Education as a thought experiment. What did the Federal Reserve spend to bail out Wall Street after the crisis? A colleague of mine and some of the PhD students in our department did a study and they came up with a number. And the number that they came up with, hang on to your hats, $29 trillion is the degree to which the Federal Reserve intervened, creating money out of thin air uh, to save Wall Street after the financial crisis. You could double Pell Grants 
and fund the system for 700 years at that level of spending. Okay, we have a student debt problem that I'm sure many in the room, especially the students, are well aware of. Um, there are ideas there, and of course, we needed to be doing much more to spend on research, innovation, technology. These are the sorts of things that lay the foundation for long-term prosperity in the economy. It's infrastructure, it's education, and it's technology and innovation. So those are my uh, opening remarks. Thanks very much. Stephanie Kelton, the chair of the Department of Economics at UMKC in Kansas City. Here's my co-host, Leslie. Please welcome Leslie here. She's making important changes in the uh, script so that our next guest does not use the same material as our preceding guest. <laughs> and I'm sure that is most, most unlikely. I would just guess, and I could be off a little bit, that uh, Professor Kelton might have gone a little bit longer than 10 minutes. And uh, that's fine, and uh, our next speaker will have that amount of time or as much time as he needs as well to make his presentation. And then after that presentation, we're going to go over here and, and sit down and start taking questions from those of you in the audience. We've got microphones set up. Reminder, just a question with your name and to whom you have your question directed. Our next guest is Joseph Haslig, a professor and the Kenneth Lay Chair in Economics at the University of Missouri in Columbia, an expert in monetary policy. He has done research at the Federal Reserve Banks of St. Louis, Dallas, and Atlanta. He serves on the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City's Economic Roundtable and the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis's Business Economic Regional Group. Professor Haslag has taught at Southern Methodist University, Erasmus University in Rotterdam, and Michigan State University. He has published research in the Journal of Monetary Economics, the Journal of Money, Credit, and Banking, and the International Economic Review, and his research has been cited in more than 100 academic papers. Please welcome to the podium, Professor Joseph Haslag. Thank you very much. Okay, so we've got a question in front of us. Um, and a legitimate question, does, does government help or hurt? And that's what we're gonna try to get at. And we're gonna try to do it in a thoughtful, sensible way, or at least in 10 minutes. So let's see what we can do. Um, so we asked this question, what are the effects of government spending on the economy? And, and in order to do it, so let me tell you how, uh, how I think about it. I think about an economy as something that's moving through time and we're, we're characterizing how quantities and how variables move through time. So this is automatically kind of a dynamic process. And so there's a lot that's gonna go on with that. We saw, uh, as a researcher, it's, you need variation. If there's something that never changes, you don't have a whole lot to study. So instead, what we need is we need variation and boy did we get it in 2008. So I feel conflicted by the following statement, but I'll, I'll put it out there because 2008 gave us, a, as a researcher, a once in a lifetime event to try to understand what drives uh, large aggregate economies, federal economies. That variation though means a lot of people are going to be suffering. So you feel conflicted because you've got good things that are going on from a scientific standpoint and what you can study you feel bad because there are people who are behind every one of those statistics that are gonna go on. Fiscal policies that were enacted in 2009, I'm gonna to get to the chase, uh, by the theoretical structure that I'm most familiar with is, was gonna cause a deeper and longer lasting recession compared with doing nothing. This kind of federal, now what, I'm not gonna say all federal spending is bad, I'm just gonna say that the way it was implemented in 2009 probably didn't do us any favors. So let's look at some broad evidence about what happens with uh, GDP and, and economic activity and federal spending. So this is a statistic that's going to come out of a paper uh, published by Robert Barrow. Um, many of you, if you took the first uh, one or two classes in, in, uh, in, an, uh, in econ, you learned something about something called the multiplier. And usually what you saw was something, if you increase spending by some amount, 
is if you dropped an increase in spending on some amount, you were gonna get a multiplier effect. So what Professor Barrow reported in his research was, yeah, if you increase spending by, by say, a billion dollars, there will be an effect, a multiplier. Unfortunately, the multiplier is less than one. GDP goes up by 700 million. So this is the best academic research that's been applied. This isn't Professor Barrow's study by himself. He's covering uh, a broad swath of research that's been published in the top economics journals. This is what the evidence is gonna have to say. So you add this $1 billion uh, stimulus and you get $700 million and you sort of ask, well, how does that happen? Why isn't it at least a break-even point? So let's go back and, and go a little bit deeper in terms of the question that we're talking about. It's important to understand the nature of the problem. The financial crisis that hit in 2008, we needed a, to, a, a careful, thoughtful understanding of what the problem was. If your answer is it was just aggregate demand that was deficient, I'm not so sure that that's a very good answer, and I'm not, but it was the one that seemed to be the genesis for the American Reinvestment and Recovery Act in, in 2009. It's important, though, to think and to understand carefully what's the nature of the problem that you're dealing with. Knowing the problem, obviously, is going to help with the solution. Every time we go to the doctor, these are, these are kind of the two things that we take us on faith. The doctor is going to understand the problem, and by knowing the problem, he's going to know the appropriate treatment. Let's see if that's going to happen in this case. So what went wrong in 2008? Why, in other words, let me go back for a second, why did I have that last bullet point on the first slide that said the economy was going to go, the U.S. economy's recession in 2008 was going to be deeper and longer lasting because of the American Reinvestment and Recovery Act? The economics is really very simple. There is first and foremost a reckoning. Every time you increase government spending, there's going to be a tax payment that goes with it. Our government, on average, doesn't play a Ponzi scheme. Some governments do. This one hasn't played one yet. So there's a reckoning in the sense that future taxes, at least, are going to have to be paid. And what's amazing about um, when we start to look at people, the things that help us understand people's behavior, is that they're amazingly forward-looking. They may not be able to anticipate exactly when those tax, tax increases are going to occur, but they anticipate higher future taxes. And that affects their behavior today. That's part of that Barrow story that I talked about. $1 billion increase, only a $700 million increase in, in, uh, in output. Future tax increases depress the economy. Okay, so this is really just two points that help understand the, 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 the kernel or the piece of evidence that I pointed to earlier. The devil is always in the detail as we move forward. So um, it matters how you spend. It matters, for example, the American Re uh, Reinvestment and Recovery Act, the nature of the spending there, and I'm going to quote Jeffrey Myron, who was on this stage uh, two and a half or three years ago. That type of spending ended up largely being redistributional kinds of spending, moving it from one group of people to another group of people, and not the kinds of th spending that ends up being productive. That's the devil in the details. Would other policies have worked? We at least have to explore that possibility thing. Just as, as sort of rational and sane people, we have to keep asking questions and trying to get the best answers that we can. Would these, what other policies might have worked? So now I'm going to sound a lot like Professor Kelton. The other policies that probably would have worked would be we could have spent things on infrastructure, highways, sewer systems. There's lots of things, water systems, that, that, uh, that exist in the US that would have been uh, something that would have made a lot more sense than the way we spent them. Research and development. Basic R&D is the, is the driving force behind the technological progress that drives our standard of living. And that's probably where the biggest difference that lies between the two participants tonight is going to, uh, where it exists, is in the difference of what's a proximate cause and what's a fundamental cause. So you lost, saw lots of statistics that were reported in previous graphs of things that were moving together. The way I understand the world, those graphs are moving together largely because both of those are endogenous variables, which is just a fancy word for it that economists use to say, that, to say that those two things are being reflective of more deeper fundamental causes that occur. R&D is one of those things, a decision that's made 
that's an investment in helping us reap the rewards of technological progress. Those kinds of technological progresses that drive the increase of standard of living that we've been able to achieve for, uh, for long periods of time. I'm going to propose that uh, instead of spending, maybe an alternative would have been uh, to change the tax rates. Not because I'm, shift, I'm talking about more money in people's pockets. To me, what matters for tax rates is that they change relative prices. They change the rates of return on the productive inputs that are used in our society. Productive inputs are labor and the machines and the buildings that we use to produce all the goods and services that we want to consume. If you change tax rates, you're going to raise the rate of return on both of those productive inputs. Standard economic thinking, whenever you uh, raise the rate of return, you're going to get more of that. Seems like a pretty sensible and straightforward kind of approach to things. What were the lessons for the crisis? One thing about the crisis was that there was a need for speed. We saw something that we had never seen before. There were going to be a lot of people who were going to be harmed. Let's not forget that. There was something that needed to be done. One problem is that fiscal policy, the kinds of spending things, it takes time to get through Congress, it takes time to get those, those expenditures out. Fiscal policy is kind of a clunky tool, and it's a clunky tool that I don't think is terribly effective because it also has with it, associated with it, higher future taxes that have to go along with it. Monetary policy, like what the Federal Reserve Bank did. I'm anxious to see the study, 29 trillion. I know the Fed's balance sheet increased by a sizable amount. I didn't see the 29 trillion figure, so I'm anxious to see that study so I can understand where those numbers came from. Certainly, all the facilities that were created by the Federal Reserve System, um, uh, both the conventional and unconventional monetary policy that they implemented was meant, at least in the short term, to deal with a problem that was very real. In other words, when mortgage-backed securities began to fall dramatically in price, one of the problems was we didn't know what those things were worth. Prior to 2008, I will tell you the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City, which I visited a couple of weeks ago, now has a database that keeps all of the underlying mortgages that back those mortgage-backed securities. We didn't have that in 2008. We do now. When we didn't know what the value of those assets were and people were buying and selling those assets trying to get liquidity, Federal Reserve is very good at providing liquidity in the short run. Maybe in the Q&A, somebody's going to ask about what we think about monetary policy in its current stance. Let's leave that for the Q&A. But at least initially, it was probably a useful thing. They didn't know who was solvent and who wasn't. So you can say, yes, they held up banks. That's undoubtedly true. There were banks that were insolvent that, that uh, should have been uh, probably liquidated. However, when you're in this kind of crisis and you go into that kind of free fall, I think there's a pretty good case for temporarily saying, we're going to create liquidity, we're going to provide that for the market, and then we'll take a stand in, in a few months after things have cleared out a little bit to see what's going on. The broad brush stroke that, we, that is going to go on this evening as, as this discussion keeps going is what is the role of government? There is clearly a role for government. I would be a fool to get up here and say that I don't want any government or I would necessarily want smaller government. What I do think is that there is good economic analysis provided for thoughtful government plans. And those things are good. We need a judicial system, for example. That's a great thing for governments to, to do. That's a fundamental thing, and, and those things are wise. However, there's lots of things that the government tries to do which may, may not make a lot of sense. And what, as an economist, our basic starting point is, is the government gets involved when there's a market failure. You can see a market failure in every human interaction if you want to. I'm going to submit, however, that there's probably a threshold that we want to create when we're setting policy to try to help the macro economy uh, be as efficient as it could possibly be. That's all I'm going to say. I'd like to turn this over for Q&A. So thank you very much. May I say, oh, yeah. first of all, that uh, both of these speakers did a superb job, and they certainly both deserve a nice round of applause. Uh, 
All right, we see a gentleman over here to my left. And sir, what is your question? Or first, what is your name? I'm Kelly Pinkham. All right, sir, and to whom do you want to direct your question, or is it to both? It's basically to both, although initially, I just say to both. And okay. Take it from there. I'm a little confused about fiscal policy and its role, and my question has to do with the role of government via fiscal policy and a comment you made regarding fiscal policy is clunky and we don't get a full return on the dollar spent, it creates additional tax demand later. In a sense, it implied there's no way for fiscal policy to do things that would pay for itself. And I'm curious about things like the interstate highway uh, system. Wasn't that something that really did more than pay for itself? If we're looking for a multiplier effect, didn't that pay huge dividends? It's just one example of how fiscal policy can produce dramatic improvement to the overall economy. All right, uh, I think that was directed. We'll start with you anyway. Uh, like what about a, fiscal it policy? Like it was a me um, of course, the interstate highway system. So, first of all, clunky is relative to trying to deal with business cycle fluctuations. It's in that context that it was uh, uh, that I wanted to refer to it as clunky. What you saw in the re in the evidence that I presented regarding uh, Professor Barrow's re uh, survey of the econometric evidence is of course, on average. So he's looking at all the programs and all the different effects. If you, you're probably aware of this, there's a beautiful paper by uh, Professor David Ashour that was in the Journal of Monetary Economics, I believe it was 1985, where he tried to estimate the, uh, the rate of return from the inter interstate highway system. Um, now, people have edged this down a little bit, but Professor Ashour's initial estimates were, was 44%. That's a pretty good rate of return, and of course, there are good projects. And that falls within my infrastructure uh, uh, citation that I made uh, before. So you, I, the general point I was trying to make was it matters what you spend things on. Um, I just don't think the American Re Reinvestment and Recovery Act was, on average, a sensible kind of policy action to deal with the business cycle fluctuation that we had in 2008. Have a reaction that you'd like to share? Yeah, so uh, I did plan to work that in, but I just uh, had too much, and, and so I truncated, and that was one of the things that got cut. But the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, which started as a $787 billion stimulus package, um, you know, was hastily concocted, and there were a lot of things that were wrong with it. It did uh, contain about one-third of the total was tax cuts. About a third of the total was aid to state and local governments, direct aid, and the rest of it came in uh, the form of government spending, whether it was infrastructure, weatherization, you know, all this energy efficiency stuff and so forth. The problem is, as big a number as that appears to be on the surface, 787 billion, it was like using an umbrella to protect yourself from an avalanche because the magnitude of the downturn in the Great Recession was so massive that in 2009 alone, one year, private borrowers reduced the amount of borrowing and spending they did in the US by $587 billion. So you're taking $587 billion out because we, households and businesses, got absolutely crushed when the housing bubble burst. Right? Everybody was scrambling to start paying down debt, saving more of their money. We didn't want to borrow and spend anymore. We wanted to borrow less and pay down debt. And so that, because we had what economists call a balance sheet recession, that was so severe in terms of the amount that we were taking out of the economy, here's the federal government trying to put $787 billion in over three years. So a, about two or $300 billion a year for three years, while we're taking out close to $600 billion in a single year. It wasn't enough. What did help was not the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. That didn't do the heavy lifting that prevented us from getting the Great Depression too. What prevented us from getting a second Great Depression were the automatic stabilizers that drove the increase in the deficit that put a floor under people's incomes. When they lost their jobs, their incomes didn't fall to zero. They had a source of income that allowed them to continue to spend a bit and pay down debt. Economists use the term deleveraging. And it was a long, ugly process that had to play out over the course of nearly six years. But anyway, um, that's All my right. answer. Question on this side, if you give us your name first, please. Yeah, Eric McCamey. 
Yes, sir. And uh, to whom question. do you want to direct your question? This question is to both. Who are the job creators, the 99% or the 1%? And who are the job creators, the 99% or the 1%? Well, I, see, I would never use that language. I don't, I don't think in those terms. I think everyone in this room it, uh, has a role to play, is part of the economy, contributes every time you go to work and earn an income and turn around and use a portion of that income to purchase something that's produced by some business in this company. You're, you're contributing to the economy. You're contributing to the, the maintenance of somebody's factory job or whatever it is. So I just don't. I, 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 I'm uncomfortable with the framing of the question. I, I think it's divisive, and, and I don't think in this All right, terms. Joe, what do you think? 99%, 1%, who are the job creators? The answer is both. Um, I mean, it, it, look, uh, things move through time. That's, that was a, one of the starting premises that I have. The 1% moves through time. When you see how many people move in and out of, of the 1%, maybe your view is that there's a constant 1% and they're constantly beating up on everybody else. But when you look at the, uh, the fraction of people who move from one income uh, group to another, it's just all part of the entire dynamic economy. So the 1% is now a group, a large number of them who might have started a tech companies in Silicon Valley or who did something else. So they were part of the 99%, maybe as short a time as three years ago. The part is, there, that we unleash the creative process. You want that creative process to be nurtured and to be, uh, to be made available. That's where job creation occurs, occurs is through technological progress is the language we use as economists, but it, fundamentally it's just human creativity. All right, I have another question over here. Uh, good evening, thanks for volunteering to uh, make a comment or ask a question, what's your name? Uh, thank you, John Proctor, and this is for uh, Dr. Kelton. Um, I noticed on your slide there weren't any recommendations for reform, uh, financial or monetary reform, and I wonder if you could uh, comment. I mean, when I look at the last 30 years of, of uh, deregulation, and I think a lot of that, you know, in my view, really uh, led to the, the factors of 2008 and how, you know, the massive theft that was enabled by all that, and in particular, if you had any comments on that bureau that uh, Elizabeth Warren created, that Consumer uh, Financial Protection Bureau. Yeah, so, uh, so a lot of what we have done, Dodd-Frank and so forth, has been sufficiently gutted that uh, I'm not sure how, how much grit, how much tooth it has. We certainly have not reinstated anything that looks like Glass-Steagall. I did have some slides. I actually also, they, uh, they got trunc it got truncated. I just had too much, but I had Chainsaw Gilliland with the stack of regulations with a big red bow wrapped around it. And this was the head of the Office of Thrift Supervision flanked by a, a number of other regulators, people who were supposed to be regulating the financial uh, industry. And you're, as you say, in the 1980s, they literally posed for a photograph with a chainsaw and hedge clippers. And this was their way of saying, we are going to liberate markets and allow them to do what they do best. And, and so we got liars, loans, no income, no job, no assets, no problem, subprime. I mean, we got the housing crisis, right? So yes, uh, financial reform for me uh, is, tr is tremendously important. You're not going to get, you're not gonna recreate the stability that we had in the 50s and 60s without recreating some of the financial constraints. Joe, how do you look at financial reform? Do you think we need some? Do you have some you'd suggest? Um, there has to be some kind of financial reform. Dodd-Frank was the silliest thing I've ever seen to try to deal with that. Um, but you don't what, know, for, what, could you, in a sentence oh, so, or two, say why? So, no, well, give me a second. Um, I, look, the, what the basic business of banking is maturity transformation. And all I mean by that is you walk to the bank and you deposit some funds, and the bank says, whenever you want these, I'm, gonna, I'm happy to give it to you. That's a great thing. Liquidity is a wonderful thing, and it makes uh, our lives a lot easier, and it's better being in the bank than it is under my mattress. However, the basic business of banking is transforming your liquid deposits into illiquid loans. And so there, is, there was a beautiful paper by, uh, uh, Peter, uh, by uh, Douglas Diamond and Phil Divig. Phil Divig's at uh, Wash U in St. Louis in the finance department. And they highlighted the basic, that basic structure and what they said was that there is always a fragility that goes along with the business of banking because of that maturity transformation process. Now, 
what's the problem? The problem is that there's a big information gap between what the banks have and what the people who are the depositors and what the lender and the borrowers from those banks, what they know about the bank's balance sheet. So clarifying or trying to deal with that information problem makes a lot more sense than just throwing regulation on a bank that says, you got to hold more capital. Is that why Dodd-Frank is silly? That's why Dodd-Frank okay. is silly. Okay. Uh, I didn't mean to set you off. I was just trying to find an answer. I'm very excited okay, about Okay, come this. up there. Uh, this lady, if you'd like to come forward and give us your name, please. Good evening. My name is Natalia. I'm Can you student. speak up just a little bit? We're having a little trouble hearing you. My name is Natalia. Yes. I'm, from, I'm a student at UMKC. Yeah. And uh, I have a more general question. And uh, I'm just really curious, what do you think? So it's a question for both uh, lecturers. And uh, should we nationalize large enterprises? And because nationalization of large enterprises would lower the cost of goods produced by taking the profit component out and uh, thereby benefiting our society overall and maybe creating, I don't know, new jobs. So your question is, should the federal government nationalize some of the major industries in America? Uh, large enterprises. Large enterprise. industries. Yes. Professor? Well, okay, let's, let's go back to banks, because this is where a lot of people uh, tended to focus their attention. We ought to be nationalizing these big banks and so forth. Um, well, you know, just quickly explain for folks what nationalized. Well, that the government mean. takes them over takes and over, runs them runs in the them, public yeah. interest, right? Uh, I, the problem is they call them systemically important institutions, sometimes called too big to fail, right? If they're too big to fail, they're too big to exist. You cannot possibly manage as a CEO a corporation of this size, they, you have absolutely no idea what's going on inside. So I am very much in favor of shrinking the size of um, these, and they're not systemically important institutions, they're systemically dangerous institutions. That's why they're too big to fail. But in terms of nationalizing um, companies, businesses, including the banks, uh, no, I think, and especially as, as you put it, is this a way to create jobs? I think there are plenty of good ways to create jobs in the economy that don't involve uh, nationalizing private businesses. I'm going to guess, Joe, that you're not in favor of nationalizing major industries. <laughs> sure, I am. Yes, no, I'm, I'm actually completely. <laughs> See, you never know. That's why we do these things. No, uh, no. I'm just going to comment on the on the uh, the banking issue one last. Uh, well, we'll see where this goes. Too big to fail is something that is a reflection of the regulatory structure in the US. I look at the Canadian system, seven banks, that's all they have. Each one of those may be too big to fail, but the problem is, or the observation, is that when you look at the Great Depression, you look at the Great Recession, the Canadian banks have done remarkably well uh, uh, during, these fa uh, during these periods and have not suffered the kind of financial crisis. So to me, that's at least prima facie evidence that what we've got is a bad regulatory structure at the heart and not uh, something that, that we're nationalizing or, or trying to deal with the banks on. Well, they on haven't had firm. their housing bust. Ireland did, we did, Spain did. That's when the banks tend to get into real trouble. So watch Canada. Uh, again, I, I don't know that the housing uh, oh, market changed. Uh, it didn't still, change. It changed enough been, in Canada if you look at the housing value. It wasn't as dramatic as the U.S. But, but again, they also didn't have, the point being is that when you've got uh, an open-ended regulatory structure like the Canadian banking system has, you get a more, you tend to get a more, or at least the way they practiced it, a more diversified portfolio and you don't get these kinds of... Uh, uh, we have a problem with executive compensation. The incentive structure is badly skewed. It is in the interest of the individuals who run these corporations to run them for their own personal gain and not for the, in the interest of the shareholders. And so we've got Certainly there are information problems in corporate governance and people are doing some serious work on that. I, I would concede that point. But I don't know what price, what wage you should be giving these people. See what you started. You apparently have a better... Thank you very much for your very good question. Let's go over here now. Uh, hello, my name is Tom Clammer and I guess I'd like to hear from both, but uh, probably first Dr. Kelton because of uh, going back to one of your slides, the... Uh, uh, rise in productivity, and I forget exactly what were the other two lines on that. Uh, yeah, wages. there was an average wage and salary compensation. Yeah, so uh, 
and the point being that compensation was following uh, productivity mm -hmm. uh, pretty close until uh, the 70s or whenever they diverged. Uh, one can certainly imagine uh, better policies than what we had, at least from a worker point of view. But during much of the time those lines were going together, there was uh, the supply and demand of labor was such that there was, you know, we were, uh, despite uh, anti-immigrant sentiments, there was a demand for immigrants to come here and work. There was a demand for labor that changed partly because of globalization and, and partly uh, automation and so forth um, that changed the world and the demand for labor isn't there partly because of that. Could, how much could policies change that and how much is it, uh, and uh, you know, maybe, maybe some of the labor demand situation is also due to policies, but how much is it a changing world that policies can affect as much as they might have in the past? Well, the one thing you didn't mention, of course, is um, union, unionization, yeah. right? <laughs> Which, the, the people who have looked at this, and lots of people write about this, you know, the break in that trend line, and people like Rick Wolf and others uh, very much focus on the role that, that the um, decline in union membership has played in, in this process as well. So I would look at Rick Wolf's stuff. You, You'd like it. Okay. All right, thank sir. You. Thank you very much. You'll be reading that later this evening. Any, anything? <laughs> oh, I'm not yeah. sure I understood the question. Uh, the, the, the world <laughs> events versus policy, was that it? Policy can have a huge effect. So uh, that, if that's the question, I, I would say policies can have huge effects. But, but doesn't it have less effect? Uh, doesn't it have less effect in a different world where there's just not the inherent demand for labor that there used to be? Um, I, I guess so. There's a what, uh, so there's a starting point here that I'm not sure I completely understand. Uh, Could I add something? Well, I don't want to interrupt you, but if you were, well, I was going to get a oh, thought. Go ahead. Out. So yeah. Um, so what I observe is the quantity of labor, and I observe the price. Uh, if you give me some variation, I can try to ascribe or identify whether it was a movement in demand or supply. But generally speaking, we don't have controlled experiments in, in economics. Look, I've asked my, my human uh, subjects board at, at MU, can I take 50,000 undergrads, put them in a room for 30 years, set up a set of, you know, create a set of rules, and then see how they behave? I would love that, but they always reject that idea. <laughs> well, I, so know. now, my point is the identific, you've made a really heroic assumption about what is the demand for labor. Prices are wonderful things for equilibrating demand and supply, all we observe is that equilibrating process, not a demand or a supply without some kind of exogenous shock or variation. And therefore, it's, the, it's that shock that is driving things and not that some underlying demand. We're gonna have to leave it there. Tom, thank you very much. Read Professor Wolf's, what was the name of it? Uh, well, he's got books, uh, yeah, no. lots of books. And all right. Read lots of books. That'll answer the question. Uh, Who's next? Or, the Crisis in Capitalism, you, I think, is the sir? book. Um, I'm uh, Bill Dunning. Uh, this, uh, you, you've touched on it uh, a little bit. My question is, to what extent did the repeal of Glass-Steagall contribute to the crisis in 2008? Okay, and please just quickly define Glass-Steagall. Glass-Steagall was the legislation that uh, drew a line between what a commercial bank can do and what an investment bank can do. Mainly, mainly it involves prop trading, tra you know, so. Okay, so if Bill Black were here, and I presume he is not, although he is in town and should be here tonight. Um, <laughs> If Bill were here, this is his area of expertise, right? My colleague, and he's got a joint appointment in the law school and in the Department of Economics. He was a regulator in, in the SNL crisis. He was the note taker during the Keating Five trial and so forth. Bill would say, and he has written a lot about this, that it was important, but it was not sufficient. That is not the primary reason that we had the crisis. And putting back, reinstating Glass-Steagall and doing nothing else does not protect you from future crises. So. 
I'll send you something if you're interested, and you can read more about what Bill's had to say. Well, to come in. My answer would be similar to what I gave to Dodd-Frank. The fundamental problem with banking is an information problem about what the, what the bank management is doing and what depositors and, and, bar, and, uh, and borrowers from the bank know about the bank's, uh, the management's activities. We're getting really short on time. Uh, have you been standing there a while? I just walked I out. thought that was the case. Yeah. Uh, no, go ahead. Uh, we'll do that and one over here, and then I'm afraid we've got to go to closing statements. But go ahead and try to be as concise as you can. Yeah, what relationship do you see between economic growth and environmental crisis, and how should that be taken into account when promoting greater consumption, greater economic growth in general for the country, for the world? Joe? I, uh, when we're talking about environmental concerns, of course, what we want to try to quantify is what are the externalities that are produced by that. So there's a market failure that's going on and we need somebody to pay attention uh, to the size of that uh, and the consequences of, of that environmental uh, uh, issue that's being uh, undertaken. Um, uh, I don't think we've got perfect mechanisms to deal with that right now, but we're making some strides. Um, I think that what you, that there's always a, uh, I wouldn't say, there's a trade-off. Um, I think uh, that's what people in a democracy get to do, is decide what level of uh, environmental uh, spoilage that they're willing to accept, and, uh, and then policies would grow out of that that, uh, that they're willing. But it's a hard thing to say what, um, uh, what, the first thing is I would urge us to carefully, and there are serious people, we're trying to quantify what the value of those externalities are and, and the negative externalities and, and dealing with something. it. The good thing is, um, if you look at a lot of uh, broad measures, the ones I'm, uh, I'm aware of, uh, air quality has gone up in the US, water quality has gone up. So we're doing something that looks uh, uh, like there's an improvement. Whether it's enough or not, we can debate. But very quickly, I know we're short on time. I will go so far as to say that I think that climate is the greatest threat to our national security and that growth for the sake of growth is not what we ought to be pursuing. I mentioned um, a, a renewed WPA, a CCC. The CCC, of course, was a civilian conservation corps. And a lot of the types of jobs that we could be creating are jobs that would reforestation. I mean, it could just go on and on and on in terms of what we can do to both create jobs and have a, a rising standard of living, growth in the economy, and do it in an environmentally recognizing limitations. Can you do a real quick question, sir? I know that's putting a lot of pressure on you. Uh, well, I'll try. Well, first, come up to the microphone a little closer and tell us your name. Uh, yes, my name is David Neal. And, yes, sir. Uh, um, I am a, a 25 years ago, I started my first company, which was a software company. My background, I have an engineering background and a computer science background. Um, we, and 10 years ago, I started another business, a construction business. In both cases, uh, the reason that I started the business was I identified a need, in other words, a demand that wasn't being met. Um, and over the period of time, uh, you know, 25 years, lots happened. The, the things that made me decide to hire people to, uh, were that I needed to increase my production in response to a perceived n need in the market, demand. There were several factors that I considered. One was, one was, one, one was demand. Yeah, yeah just, uh, can you I'm just gonna get, there. get the question there? One was demand. The second was also availability of resources to to, um, to, to grow the business, including intellectual capital. What I hear a lot in the political discourse is that people like me are most interested in lower tax rates. And that's to me, is a much lower priority because I, first of all, got to have a market for my products. Uh, how, how can my, the rate of return that you're talking about that's affected by taxes, how, 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 is, how can I see that as being more important than these other factors? Just, what do you mean more? I, uh, well, I, to me, it seems that's a, a lower priority than to have demand for my, so my I'm product. All, well, demand is, a, is subject to the price that you can charge in the market, right? So quantity demanded, the law of demand tells us that demand curve is downward sloping, holding everything else constant. Now, having said that, all I was saying was that the rate of return, which is just another price, 
is going to matter for, uh, for people in terms of making their decisions. You didn't have any control over what those rates of return were. You had projections of what they were, I presume, and, it, and hopefully it worked out. But, but holding everything else constant, lowering the tax rate is going to raise the rate of return. You don't want to do that all the time, but it is, I think that's in, incontrovertible. Yeah, all, all, I was, all I was saying was just that it seems like that's less important in my decision making. It seems like in most instances, prices, in the mar prices are first order importance when people are making decisions about how to allocate scarce resources. That's kind of the fundamentals. We're going to be removed from this room if we don't wrap this up. So, Stephanie, do you have any quick reaction to what he Oh, no. Said? I just okay. wanted to say thank you to everybody for coming out um, on a t Tuesday evening. Yes. And <laughs> sharing this with well, us. I mean, it was really lovely to ha come in and see so many faces. So. Thank you very much. I, we were going to have closing statements, but we've run a little bit long, so I trust neither of you will be offended if we, we don't do that. May I say, uh, it's been a real pleasure to meet Stephanie Kelton and Joe Haslig, uh, and, and I'm delighted that so many of you came out this evening. I think it was informative. I think it was entertaining, and I think uh, these speakers deserve one more very wait, generous... Before you do, no, wait. Before you do, let me just add, let me just say one thing. The, the best and most economics I learned was usually over a beer. So if all of you can go out, we got time, and uh, we'll just talk about that right now. So thank you very much.